Dyslexia is a reading and writing disability that runs in families and affects one in five of the American population. But even less people know and get help with it. The common but widely unknown reading disability affects one's ability to read and write, but in no way affects intelligence or thinking ability. In fact, some of the smartest, most well-known people have had dyslexia, including Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, Walt Disney, Alexander Graham Bell, Whoopi Goldberg, and many others. My sister Phoebe has dyslexia and has struggled reading and writing for her whole life. Although she actually loves reading more than anyone else I know. Here is her story. I found out I had dyslexia when I was in first grade. I think back then it didn't really affect me because I was so little. But I think that it really did start affecting me when I was in fourth grade because I think that that was around the time period that um, we started doing read, we started reading to the class, and I was good at that, and I could obviously see that I wasn't good at that. Um, I wasn't good when I was reading alone, I was good when I was spelling, I was just bad at it, and I think that's, that's what happened, and that was the year I left, and I'm at Athena Academy right now, um, an all dyslexic school, and I think that it was a good change between Peninsula and Athena because Athena really helped me focus on overcoming my weaknesses in reading and writing and spelling and stuff like that. And I think that I was I was really good choice for me to go to Athena. But now I'm going to set up school where I am hopefully going to have a good time. My story with dyslexia started with my second daughter. Um, in first grade, her teachers um, started saying things like she turned her back during language arts lessons and couldn't remember her alphabet, and um, they thought that maybe she might need tutoring. Um, as soon as we got her um, into tutoring, the tutor, who was a longtime teacher at, um, the, at the school that we were um, going to, um, whose children were dyslexic, knew um, a woman who had um, been a part of a long-standing educational services practice in Palo Alto and um, said that we should get her tested to see if she had dyslexia. And we did have her tested. She did um, have um, uh, dyslexia, which is a very broad term, but um, she had a disorder of written expression. And... Um, that was our first experience with uh, dyslexia and how we found out about it. One of the things I like to do in my free time would probably be listening to audiobooks. It is one of my favorite hobbies. It is fun and it's easy to buy books on Audible. And it's saying that it's watching TV in your head is an understatement. It is, I'm paid to say this, way better than TV. It is awesome. I enjoy it so much. I think that because of audiobooks, I still have the love of literature that I do today. I can read multiple books in a day. I do that a lot. I can read three or four on a good day if I have enough time. And I listen at the third speed, which is three times faster than the person is actually talking. So if I'm talking fast, it's just because I'm used to hearing it fast. Um, I listen to it while... I'm going to sleep. I listen to it at every break I have during school. I listen to my books all the time, every time, I, every chance I get. I like, though people beg me to stop reading the same books over and over again, and every once in a while I'll go on a crazy reading spree where I buy all these books and I just read them and just read them, all of them at once, and it's great. But usually I'm reading over what I've already read because there is so many books I have read, and it is very good to just refresh my memory. On I would just uh, listen to audiobooks if you don't feel like you're super connected to reading, because it will really, it will really inspire you to get back into the love of literature that I have done, and I think that it's really great, and you should try. This is one. Audible Inc. presents Keeper of the Lost Cities, written by Shannon Messenger, narrated by Julie Roundtree. For mom and dad, who always believed this day would come, 
and because I'm hoping imaginary grandchildren count. Preface. Blurry, fractured memories swam through Sophie's mind, but she couldn't piece them together. She tried opening her eyes and found only darkness. Something rough pressed against her wrists and ankles, refusing to let her move. A wave of cold rushed through her head. Um, some of the things that come easily to my dyslexic child um, are three-dimensional thinking. She has the ability to notice very remote specific details almost photographically in her memory and she can recall those those elements. She is a highly imaginative creative person. Um, she draws, she plays music, she's a writer um, and a storyteller. I would say that um, one of the main things about my child is that she is um, she's uh, she's a bookworm. She loves stories. She loves to hear them, and she loves to create them. So she's a writer. She's very um, she's very artistic and very much a very strong in pattern matching. I think many many people think that because I have dyslexia, I'm better at things like music and visual spatial thinking and I naturally can do all these great things that are going to come in so much can come in handy later in life when I actually get a job and stuff but really I don't think that's the case I think that because I feel like I am pretty good at those things but I think that that's not because of dyslexia it's probably just because that because I'm not so great at some of these things earlier in life I just decided to focus on some of the good things or things that seemed fun to me, and that's why I'm good at those things. Not because of my brain being open to them at the beginning of my life and not reading and writing. A lot of people in my life have been begging me, kind of, to write down my ideas because I am constantly making stories in my head and making scenes and maybe even taking my books that I'm reading right now and cutting out parts that I didn't like and making it my own way, or writing fan fiction about what I think should have happened or what will happen after Happily Ever After. So I think that I love doing that and I love thinking about it and sometimes I explain my ideas to people and they're like, whoa, that's really good, Phoebe. You should write that down. I'm like, ooh, ooh, <laughs> well, what I like about it being in my head is that you can always change it if you don't like it. and. I think that that's the best thing for me because I like to change it a lot and that that that's what I've been worrying about is that I'm going to be like writing it and then I'll be like, wait a second, what if this is instead? That's such a better idea. Man, this book is pointless because if I had that idea at the beginning, it would have been so much better. But this time I'm not so worried about it because um, unlike in my other books, I fairly positive about um, trying to hold on to this one idea and not letting it slip away and not trying to think of anything else but this this series of these characters and what will happen to them and all these things because a writer is supposed to know their characters like they're your friends in real life and I'm starting to feel that way about my characters and that's a great sign and I'm so excited about this and I'm so excited that I'm actually going to write down one of my real ideas I have written down a memoir that I liked before, but never a real chapter book. And I'm so excited that I'm actually going to get this done. And I'm positive that it's going to turn out pretty good. Or I hope it will. There aren't many kids my age who can say they've written a book. Especially for kids their own age. Me. So I'm happy. It's hard to have a child with dyslexia. Because... Everything is harder for them in a traditional environment and everything about growing up in this country in this society and this part of the world is very traditional. So if your brain works differently than other people's, you're at a tremendous disadvantage in the classroom. I think that once Phoebe grows up and gets out and pursues her, um, her life's journey or uh, journeys and paths, she'll be completely fine. But the journey through the the school system in the United States for dyslexics is a very difficult journey and um, it certainly isn't made easy by schools and teachers and it's only, it's, if it's easy, it's only easy because um, dedicated parents and teachers and therapists and people have come together to make it so for that student. I think it's, it's not the, 
the regular experience for a dyslexic though. Okay. Some things that are hard about having dyslexia would probably be little things when teachers or would ask you embarrassing things like when teachers would ask you in front of the entire class how to spell something or for an answer to something or just um, like to read a paragraph in the sentence and you trip over the easiest word that is so embarrassing when that happens and it's way more embarrassing when the whole school laughs or points it out and that's just the worst that's one of the really hard things about having dyslexia is putting up with those little missteps that seem so little to everyone else and so huge for you because the hardest thing about having a child with dyslexia is advocating for um, their needs with uh, teachers, coaches, um, pediatrician, therapists, um, all sorts of people in their lives. Um, that's the most challenging part of having a child with dyslexia. I'm super proud of Phoebe all the time because she's such a hard worker. It's hard to pull out specific times because I'm super proud of her all the time. But one time where I remember being specifically very proud of her was um, during the pre uh, Passover Seder, a year after she had been at a school just for dyslexics. Um, we went around the table and all the kids got a chance to read out of the special prayer book and Phoebe could read. It was really gratifying and touching and a terrific milestone for her and for her family. I wanted to find out other people's journeys and experiences with dyslexia, and I was lucky enough to interview the learning specialist at my school, Dana Cooper, who also has dyslexia. She has had a very different experience than my sister Phoebe. Here is her story. Um, so when I was in second grade, um, my teacher recommended that I get some extra testing done. Um, so I was in a Denver public school and I don't know, I went through the process there um, and the test came back um, and at the time, I'm not, I, this is my understanding of it kind of when I was told later, um, that my reading scores weren't great but my math scores were pretty high and so all together I only had kind of like one area where I was really struggling so they just said, you know, she's fine, um, she needs a little extra help with reading. So I kind of kept struggling with reading. Um, at some point, changed schools. Um, would go to like speed reading camps and get tutoring, but never was diagnosed as dyslexic. And then it was in high school that I was really like struggling. I just wasn't getting through any of the reading. I wasn't getting through any of the reading in middle school either. But um, being in high school really started to be super apparent. Um, and so at some point I was in a Spanish class and we had a long-term substitute and he asked if I was dyslexic because the mistakes I was making when I was reading were just so like classic dyslexia. Um, and I said, I didn't know. Um, and I was in this debate class and the first type of debate you did was you memorized the speech and you like presented it. Um, and the next type of debate you did is you had these huge massive boxes of uh, research and you pull them out and read them as fast as you can and then, then the other team would pull it out and read it as fast as they can. And I was so bad at that. Um, so they actually didn't have me compete anymore and they put me on the research team for the following year. And I was researching special education um, and in particular learning disabilities. And so I'm doing all this research and I'm reading about dyslexia and I was like, this is all super eerie. So at that point, I went and talked to my parents and they said, yeah, that we'd get testing again. My mom's, um, two of our sisters were diagnosed as dyslexic. She was never tested, but yeah. So it was after that, um, was diagnosed and the tester, or the lady who kind of did my evaluation, said that it was super obvious from the second grade stuff that I was dyslexic, but the school district didn't identify it. So it wasn't until I was like 11th grade, I think that I 
was formally diagnosed. I thought for a long time that I wasn't very smart. I just had to really work hard um, to kind of keep up. And it was a big relief when I finally found out that like it was, that wasn't the, the case. Um, so it gave me, it helped a lot. I would say one of the toughest things, I still really dislike reading. I'm a super slow reader. Um, I, for a very long time, didn't like reading books, and I still actually don't like reading them with my eyes. I listen to everything on tape. Um, I still have a little bit embarrassed when I, you know, say, oh, I finished reading this book, and in reality, I didn't actually read it. I was listening to it. Um, and honestly, the, I think the toughest thing is just the sheer quantity of, like, email um, that I get. And anything related to reading and writing at work just takes me that much longer. Um, I really, really scrutinize every email I send. I've kind of started to, once I get comfortable in a certain type of community and I know people know that I'm dyslexic, I don't triple check everything. Um, but that, it's just, it's just, it's a time situation where everything just takes that much longer. Um, anytime we have to read something, it just takes me that much longer. I do use like text-to-speech on my computer, but that's still not nearly as efficient as people who can just kind of read without any trouble. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, it's like I remember doing book clubs and stuff when I was in New York with my friends and I'd have to get the, the book on tape and it was, you know, I think it's tough because people don't understand um, what dyslexia is and they think it's something related to you not being smart. The audiobooks has like really opened up literature for me. Before that it just wasn't happening. You know, I've thought a lot about this, about what might be kind of a result because, you know, the, with dyslexia, people say your brain's wired differently and so it's like how much is a result of maybe brain wiring being wired differently versus how much is a result of kind of like coping mechanisms. Um, so I think with the first thing, I think it's when things are tough, I feel like, you know, as soon as I was exposed to reading when I was in kindergarten, preschool, that was tough. And so it's, and it's still been tough. Um, so I think I might be somewhat, have a strength of uh, sticking through with things that are difficult or challenging, um, just because something that a lot of people take for granted, like reading, wasn't easy for me. Um, it's still not easy. Um, I think I'm really amazing at building Ikea furniture. And so I think there's something about kind of a visual spatial strength. Um, honestly, if the world were written in Ikea manuals, like I would be, I don't know, super successful. Um, there's something about that. I just, I mean, that's like a weird skill, but I think in other ways that's, I do really well with visual things. Um, at some point I changed my major in college um, to fine arts because uh, I was really, did a lot, um, did really well with art things. So. Um, art history classes, I was studying architecture for a while, and I just, I felt like those were an area where my strengths were definitely played to. So, um, and math is definitely something I'm a lot more comfortable at, I think. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's because of dyslexia or if that's just other things that I am strong at. Like you're awesome first and foremost uh, don't I mean I think the thing that I found when I found out that I had dyslexia I kind of stopped um, judging myself or being so critical um, and started to kind of embrace the fact that you know here's an explanation as to why this was difficult um, but I could start focusing on all the things I did really well um, I would say you know, you're going to have to always just work harder. Um, you know, never, never to use dyslexia kind of as an excuse, um, but kind of know that in terms of reading and writing, that's always going to be a little bit harder. But 
that there are going to be other things that come to you really fast um, and em really embrace those strengths. Um, and, you know, advocate for yourself. I think that would be a huge thing. So if you're having trouble, you know, go talk to your teachers and really um, let them know. In college, it was interesting because I would go and talk to professors about being learning disabled and I'd had such a wide range of reactions. Um, I'd get extended time on tests and some teachers would have me like hand in my tests like I was turning in my tests like with everybody else and then they'd sneakily meet me around the corner and give me the extra time. And I always thought that was weird because I had no problem telling anybody in my classes that I was dyslexic um, and would just say, you know, hey, actually I'm dyslexic, can I get a copy of your notes after class? And that, that was really helpful. Um, and then I had other professors that thought, they're like, oh, you know, if you just actually do all the reading and you don't get all of this on tape, um, you'll magically be better. So I think the other thing that I would say is as these kids get older, just know that there's a lot of misconceptions about dyslexia and people still aren't gonna understand. Um, so yeah, be patient with those people. Try not to get frustrated.